Ready? Okay. Yeah, and she's already quoted the end. Uh, so no. So. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Uh, welcome to our regular meeting of the Lambertsville Unified School District Board of Education. Tonight is October 7th. At this time, if everyone would please silence their cell phones and please note that this meeting is being recorded. Uh, call this meeting to order at 701. There are blue cards, uh, speaker cards are available in the back if you'd like to speak during public comment. So if you could get those in, that would be much appreciated. At this time, I'd like to introduce Ms. Tara Bell from Cuesta Elementary, who's going to be introducing our uh, students who are going to be leading us in a Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you, President Balzarini. Tonight, we have Misa Sajan and Nora Kunar leading us in the pledge and um, supporting us. We have Chimmy Mutella, Brianna Doe, Nor um, Nata Natisha Zane, Sophia Gonzalez, and Christian McNillian. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. And uh, we're going to deviate a little from the agenda. Uh, we're going to start the presentation for Cuesta Elementary now since we have all of our students up here. Leadership, leadership is a program to encourage students to dream more, no matter the circumstance or situation, from big to small, exciting or dull, to see beyond from their present into their past, as well as daring to dream up what they can bring to their student body as not just a student, but as a student with a purpose. We are able to see their overall capabilities as a student, person, and a pursuer. Thank you. Our leadership stu students teach others that dreaming is done with determination, recognition, enthusiasm, ability, and for the most part, motivation. Our Students of the Month assemblies are the best at doing just that. During our Student of the Month assemblies, we award students for their character. Later during the assembly, the people who won that character trait for their class play a goofy game which entertains the audience. As long as the people learn to continue to dream, they will learn to achieve, which is a big goal for our leadership class. <clears throat> learn more. It's something we all do every day, the reason we come to school every day. The only difference about learning compared to any other school, we make it fun. ASB takes learning to a whole new level. We do activities such as Red Ribbon Week to stay drug free, to honor students about their characters because it counts. ASB allows us to learn how to set a goal for ourselves. The leadership elective is more than making posters and organizing events. It's about getting more involvement and making people feel like they belong in this school. It's about making our school feel like a big family. Our goal is to make Cuesta a place that when new students come in, they feel our unity and join in as well.
do more. Our leadership community encourages other students to do more by helping our community and the people in it. Other steps we take to do more is to educate ourselves and others. Leadership students are that kid always asks people if they need help. Events that we conduct that do exactly this include the Turkey Trot, an event that raises our school funds in a great way, and our Student of the Month assemblies. Be the change in your school and community. Impact the world. Become more. Prove you are worthy to be a leader. You can do this by caring for yourself, others, and your surroundings. Help others share ideas, resolve problems, and become more. You can become more by paying attention in class, and when others need help, you have the knowledge to help and make your classmates feel smart. You don't just live to be a human being. You live to have an impact to the world. Make a change. Go far beyond your comfort zone. Let's remember what John Quincy Adams quoted. If your actions inspire others to dream more, learn more, do more, and become more, you are a leader. That concludes our pre presentation. Thank you. On behalf of the board, thank you very much for being here tonight. Uh, we always appreciate having students come and present for us. It uh, reminds everyone why we're here. And uh, great job with the presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. So for the students, we have um, a long, fun, action-packed meeting tonight. But <laughs> if you guys don't want to stay, you absolutely don't have to. So you guys can take off if you'd like. And roll call, please. Matthew Balzarini. Here. Colin Clements. Here. Sharon Lempel. Here. Shane Nielsen. Here. David Pombo. Here. Sa Samantha D. Tiberis. Here. Uh, approval and or corrections of the agenda. There are none. I move we approve the agenda. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Uh, receiving a public comment. Uh, we generally allow three minutes for public comment or 20 minutes per topic. Uh, Comment cards are available in the back. I have two so far. First is Nancy Matthews. Hello. I'm Nancy Matthews. I teach fifth grade at Bethany Elementary School, and I'm a member of the RCD team. And I left the last board meeting and the, the uh, Starbucks night really concerned about all the frustration and um, and I thought a lot about it, and I do think that teacher morale is an issue, and I do believe we need to work on communication. But I also felt that there were a lot of other issues all tangled up together, and uh, I wanted to just speak to one tonight because it kept coming up, and that is RCD. I know people have legitimate concerns about RCD, and I don't argue with that at all, but I do see it a little differently. Even if we'd gotten some kind of pilot from a publisher, we would have had many of the very same concerns. It would have been riddled with mistakes too. It would promise us everything and not deliver. We'd have multiple teacher manuals and spend just as much time trying to figure out that program as we are trying to figure out RCD units. We'd get a laundry list of ideas of how to differentiate instruction and it would still be up to us to make it work. I love the RCD units. I think they're fabulous. My students are engaged and excited. Collaborative group work and, in, and technology are embedded in the units. I would pick my fraction unit or heroes and villains over any Hoot and Mifflin, Basil Reader, or Harcourt Brace math program that you would buy me. You know, in the end, it comes down to you, the teacher, your students and the standards. It's always been that way. That really hasn't changed. How are you, the teacher, going to help your students master the standards? And the real difference right now is that we're all learning all these new standards, and it's a lot of change all at once. We're working twice as hard, and we're discouraged. It was always going to be a challenging few years, and that really doesn't have anything to do with RCD. I also want to point out that the district has responded to our concerns about rigor and consistency between units and grade levels and RCD. 
You know, we've got Heather and Jenna and Brian, and they have hit the ground running. They're there to help teachers implement tech and RCD, and they're helping us as RCD team members to make sure that our units are rigorous enough and that there is consistency. I know that another concern is the amount of time teachers are out of their classrooms trying to build these units, and it is a hardship on the kids, and it's, it's hard on our coworkers. And I'd like to suggest we consider more teachers on special assignment or maybe looking at next school year building in some buyback days so that teachers who want to work on the units could earn the extra pay and have the time to actually build the units without missing instructional time. The most exciting part of RCD is the high level of collaboration between teachers across sites and even across grade levels. We're emailing each other's questions, rubrics, resources, we're sharing ideas and lessons, and we know it's well documented that if you want teacher performance to improve, it's got to be teacher to teacher. And when, ah, when that really happens, um, student achievement skyrockets. I'm almost there. Um, collaboration is happening more now than at any other time in this district. We need to know which Friday specifically we're going to have in advance so we can plan for it. I can tell you that fifth graders across the district right now are creating Google Docs. They're doing Google presentations, and they're doing it without a blink of an eye. I mean, it's, it's only October. A couple years ago, we wouldn't have had that ability, and a lot of districts still don't. Thank you for your comments. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, next speaker, Summer Wolf. Good evening, Summer Wolf here. I am a mother of two children that attend a school here in this community. And right now, you guys, I'm honestly more confused than ever. <laughs> I'm going to start out by just saying that every day I walk out my doorstep, I take my children to school, I drive to work. All I can do is pray that they're getting a good education, that the teachers have adequate tools to be able to teach my children. And when I enter my home after dinner time, I want to say hello to my children. I don't want to try to teach them their math assignment, their history work, or work on something. I'm not here to complain today about the science fair or the homework or the fact that sometimes I feel like our kids are actually eating lunch in the Army. Um, I'm actually here on behalf of my children's future education in this community. I'm wanting to know, did I make the right decision to move here? Did I make a mistake? Should I find somewhere else to live? But the answer I keep coming up is no. This is my community. This is my home. I'm the taxpayer. So when I have people reaching out to me and I'm going to meetings and hearing Hearing these sad stories about people that are suffering, and all they are is the people that teach my child. Wait a minute, my teachers and the people around me that educate my children are saying they have no books and no curriculum. They're saying we have broken down computers, therefore when my child comes home and doesn't have all the AR points that are required, it's only because of lack of tools for him to take that AR test, not because the three books he read every night, being the first, first, or being the first grader in uh, receiving the most AR points ever at Cuesta when he went there, and now here he is barely scraping to get enough to pass this semester because he doesn't have the proper tools as far as computers go. Um, all I'm hearing on my end is that teachers are frustrated. They're leaving. I can't change their pay, nor can you guys honestly change their pay, but what we can do is provide them what they're asking for, and all I hear them say is, Give us the curriculum. We don't want to go home and design something. I don't want to spend three hours on a 30-minute lesson. I want to be able to walk in every morning and have an established plan for the year. Like, I want my teacher, as myself being organized, even if I'm, I'm not a teacher, but if I homeschool tomorrow or I open this charter school that I'm thinking about doing, if, if things don't go my way, this is my community. And everyone sitting here has value. Even you guys have value here. All of you, I hope, have value here. We're only here because this is what we want to do with our life. This is our choice, their choice to be teachers, your choice to sit where you're sitting, and my choice to be up here speaking on behalf of the middleman. I'm not here for anybody else but the future. The children are our future. They're going to be the ones in the nursing homes taking care of every single one of you guys. They're the ones who are going to take care of us and their education. You asked both of my students, this is their worst Honestly, I can't say that for both of my students, but one of my students, it's just not going well with the new structure, you guys, and I just need help for getting our teachers the proper 
curriculum and stuff to walk out every day and feel like they did their job the way they knew they can do it for our kids. So thank you all for your time. And I just know that we're going to make it happen for everyone because all of us in this community is really special. Every one of you guys are here because you care about our future. Thank you. Thank you, thank thank you for you. your comments. Uh, presentations. Item A is uh, an employee resign. Uh, excuse me, recognition. <laughs> I'm going to have uh, Dr. Gill uh, come up. Uh, we have a very special uh, person who's been working uh, exceptionally hard for us. Good evening, Governing Board and Dr. Nicholas. Uh, if you could all please come down here to recognize our special employee, that would be great. So this employee um, came to us uh, when we were we had about 2,700 students. Um, Single-handedly, this employee has been uh, one of the reasons why we have been keep been able to keep up with all the uh, the growth uh, and ha have been able to hire all these employees. Because when we add 1,300 students, that also means adding about 80 more employees. And there is no way we would have been able to do it if Athena Rios would not have done the kind of work she has done. It's just amazing. It's just beyond amazing. Um, she she does get lots of her guidance and those kind of things from our former HR person, which was Noel Valjuni, who had done an excellent job on that as well. But um, hiring this many employees, since January, we have screened over 2,000 applications, have done about 500 interviews, um, five, four, five hundred, uh, or actually more than that, reference checks for that many people. We are currently still doing the same exact thing, still hiring teachers, still hiring classified employees, and uh, she's constantly working on all those those things. And the best thing is, in HR, and Ms. Lampel knows this too, with all this amount of work, you also have to have every single detail very, very too precise to be perfect. And she's really good at that. And what I'm most proud of her is the amount of her, the kind of customer service she provides to our to our staff. Because from HR, that is the HR is the face of the district, and we want to make sure our, our employees feel valued when they come to HR. And she does a beautiful job with that. So I would like to invite uh, Athena Rios to be recognized <laughs> by our board members. Item B was the Cuesta student report, which we've completed. Item C, FlipCon. I'm going to ask uh, Principal Faubert to come up and speak to uh, the FlipCon conference possibilities here. Um. Good evening, board members, superintendent. Um, we have an opportunity that uh, we will have coming up pretty soon here in, um, and I'm trying to look for the date because I forgot to put it on the slides, in February, uh, February 19th or 20th, where we have an opportunity to bring in an organization called the Flip Learning Network to do a regional FlipCon, which is a conference of educators that come together to talk about flipped learning and blended learning. And so I just want to tell you a little bit about it. Um, first of all, what is it? It's a local flip learning technology integration conference. And they highlight uh, a lot of different things you see listed up there. 
mainly flipped learning, obviously, which is a blended learning strategy, one of the blended learning strategies. They talk about educational pedagogy, technology considerations for the classrooms, tips for technology tools to use, and sharing of ideas and gives deeper learning opportunities for teachers and administrators. Um, and it brings in nationally known flipped and blended learning teachers and educators to make presentations during the school day. Um, and it also may give us an opportunity to have our own students and teachers be on a panel to be questioned by people who come in and ask, uh, you know, probing questions about our own technology-rich environments here in Lammersville Unified School District. Um, and also, we're, we would look to also do a, a session at the conference where we would take a smaller group of people who sign up beforehand to go on classroom observations to look at what it looks like on the ground. So um, why host FlipCon in Lammersville Unified? First of all, it's a really great way to start putting Lammersville Unified School District on the map. Um, it gives opportunities for our teachers also in our district to attend the conference. This conference typically costs between $250 and $350 per person, but we would get qu quite a number of free um, entrances to this uh, conference for K through 12 teachers. And we would encourage that you know we offer it to teachers from across the district for those free ones. Um, <clears throat> it's also a really great opportunity not just to be seen and get on the map, but to show people what we're doing at our school and to recruit, which is what we really need right now. Right now, people have the opportunity in today's educational market to choose where they teach. And <clears throat> I believe we have something very unique for educators who are tech savvy, who are looking for that changing educational environment that fits in with their educational philosophy. And the more we can do that, and the more we can show that to our the, the bigger community, the likelier we are to get teachers who, who already know how to do these kinds of things or are on the cutting edge. Um, and uh, it also allows our own teachers to have an opportunity to participate in a professional conference that's right here. It's cheaper. <laughs> Um, so what is the Flip Learning Network? They have a network of over 20,000 educators. There is a national conference every year. This year, Brian Shum and Brian Gervas actually presented at FlipCon in Michigan. Um, it's a large conference and, you know, I don't know if it's hundreds or thousands of people show up. Close to a thousand people. <laughs> so quite a few people, but it's a network, again, with an online network like this. A lot of people don't feel the need to actually come, but they, <laughs> they participate on a regular basis in social media networks that help them uh, with their professional development. But it is the largest flipped learning group on a global scale. Um, and the goals of the flipped learning network are listed up there. Those are listed on their website. So. So the question is, who will attend this? We would be inviting people from the region to come and participate, professional educators, some of our own, some from neighboring districts. Um, the other thing that we, we have worked out with Flip Learning Network is they are willing to give very deep discounts to college students, uh, discounted rates for college students who are finishing their student teaching and ready to go into teaching to come to this, and so we would work with our local colleges and universities to recruit people to come to this. And then educational experts and presenters will be coming to us, and then any board members or district administrators who are interested in coming are obviously welcome to come. So there is a lot of information about the Flipped Learning Network at flippedlearning.org, and if you have any questions, we're hoping to bring this to our district. They're looking for uh, some feedback from us very soon to nail those dates down as we we need to start doing some advertising if that's what we're going to do. So, questions? So, <clears throat> being that we're growing and we're not using all of the rooms in our high school yet, we have enough space to host this? Absolutely. So, we have plenty of empty classrooms that we would set up sessions that people would be able to go from. There would be people on campus and it would we would work out some supervision. People would have badges on if they were part of the the, the conference, et cetera, they'd check in and we'd make sure that uh, it was a, still a safe environment for our students. And I think the recruitment ideas and uh, getting the organization to give deep discounts to students in teacher ed programs, fabulous. 
fabulous. There's going to be your base for any new positions that we have for next year. Yeah. Great ideas. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm hoping you find as much opportunity for teachers to participate because from my perspective, I would, I would gather some of the complications that we're having is there's so many things that are so new and to have people that have been doing this and having some experience to get more than just the few trainers that we have trying to matriculate that knowledge down the line. You know, I'm, I'm, I realize what that means as far as pulling teachers out of classrooms and stuff, but that's conferences. If you're going to go to a conference, you're going to miss class. So there's a give and take there, but I'm, I'm hoping we can get as many teachers as possible to participate because it is. It's an opportunity to hear from others what they do and what makes them successful. And, and just like anything else, when you're networking, sharing good and bad ideas and best practices and stuff. So I'm, I'm hopeful. Ben, I, I don't know if it would even be a good idea, but would it be, uh, there's a lot of people in the community that, you know, still don't really understand exactly what flipped learning is and, and, and how, to, how to internalize that in their own families. Would it be a good idea or would it even be possible to have, and I know that most of FlipCon is going to be collaborative, but would it be possible to have like one venue where it's information, it's public information where a panel kind of talks about what flip, you know, like, you know, mm -hmm. basically leverage it for the community and maybe that's a bad idea, I don't know. Well, you know I, I think that the organization fliplearning.org, uh, uh, the Flip Learning Network, w is willing to work with us on whatever it is we want to do during this conference and I think that that might be a good suggestion to make at the end of the day maybe for, um, presenters and things, maybe to do a panel presentation for community members to, to listen community members hear. to listen and hear and ask questions right. and get feedback. That's definitely something I can take back to the organization. The, the schedule is not set. They're looking for a date to nail down before they actually nail down presenters who are going to come. They've got people kind of on strings waiting for the date. But yeah, I think that's something we can definitely speak to the organizers about. Well, I, th I think it's a great idea. Yeah. And, and my my thought that it's a great idea isn't contingent upon that. I just right. thought I'd ask the question. Yeah, yeah. Sure, yeah, I, we hadn't thought of that. Thank you. I think Colin's idea is a great one. I know it would be very difficult to get people from the conference to present at night, and we right. are a commuter town. Yeah. But we could uh, solicit questions from the community and film the session right. and put it on the website, Absolutely. and then it's available yeah. to our community Absolutely. who would, might not be able to make it to a 3 or 4 o'clock right. session. Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, this is great. Um, glad to see it. I'm really excited it's going to be here also. I'll make sure I make every, you know, if I'm available, I will definitely be there. Okay. Great. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Ben. Thank you, Ben. Consent items for consideration. There are several. Uh, item A is the approval of the governing board meeting minutes from September 16th. There are a couple of changes. They're reflected on the copies that you have and updated on the website. Uh, item B, approval of 2015-16 hires. I would like to acknowledge uh, Brian Shum, our vice principal at Mountain House High School. Welcome. Congratulations on the position. Thank you for being here tonight. So, uh, would you like to read the rest? I absolutely would, and I would like to um, piggyback on that. Brian, that's not an easy test you took to get this credential, <laughs> so congratulations. <laughs> so I'd like to welcome to our Lammersville family, again, Brian Shum as the high school vice principal, Marlis Riesdorf, a self-contained classroom teacher, Louis Rivera, another self-contained classroom teacher, Roy Augustian, physics teacher, you found a physics teacher. I'm jealous. <laughs> okay. Rena Cora, Administrative Secretary, Personnel Clerk. <clears throat> Josephine Garcia, High School Secretary. <clears throat> Excuse me. Lindsay Webb, Elementary Office Supervisor. Maria Martinez, High School Custodial and Security. Stephanie Pascal, Campus Supervisor. Nicholas Anderson, IT Tech One. We could not do what we do for our students without the addition of these people to our family. So welcome and thank you for what you're about to do. Uh, item C is the approval of the 15-16 K-8 volleyball coaches. Item D, approval of the 15-16 high school coaches. Item E, acceptance of two resignations. And item F is uh, updated 15-16 fundraisers. I'd like to move for approval of consent items as presented. Second. Who's second? I was. 
Aye. First and second, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Uh, district administrative reports, item A is superintendent's report. Uh, budget update, LCFF, and teacher negotiations. Uh, this was something I asked for the superintendent to add to the agenda to give us a presentation of kind of where we're at and so the board has an understanding where we're at. We can ask some questions when it's finished. Good evening, Mr. President, board members, Madam Student Trustee. Uh, it's my pleasure to speak tonight. I'm glad the picture came up. I was thinking, uh, so we have some cute kids, and uh, then Ben's big idea, and I'm going to talk about the California state budget. So uh, <laughs> hope not to disappoint. Dylan has a fun job. <laughs> All right, so I want to start off the presentation talking to the board and the community a little bit about um, local control funding formula. It's been around for a little bit now, uh, but it's really important uh, in the context of how the governor has moved forward budgeting for education uh, to understand this process. So there are three pieces of the funding formula. There's a base grant, a supplemental grant, and a concentration grant. Those are contingent on uh, certain populations of students, low income, English learners, and foster youth. And districts with percentages of students in those areas get additional funds. They also break down funding into grade levels. So there's a K-3 grade level uh, allocation, 4, 6, 7, 8, and 9, 12, and additional funding for class size reduction and career technical ed. I do want to point out uh, and, and compliment uh, Alvina and our board. We have, since 2012 as a district, already matched the state expectation for class size reduction, which is 24 to 1 per classroom. But this is how the governor's vision of funding school is built. So I thought it would be important to say, what does that look like in, 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 the, in the real world? So I have three districts here, Stockton Unified, Tracy Unified, and Lammersville Unified. And if you look at the breakdown of low-income students, English learners, and foster youth, it starts to tell a story about the community in which students live, where they reside, the neighborhoods they come from, and the schools they attend. And when you look at the difference between a community of 82% 80, low income to 45% low income to 14% low income, you start to see what the governor's vision is, which is student who, students who come from less means, school systems get more apportionment of the state funds. The third column here is very important. It's called the unduplicated count. And what that does is it points out at the representation of how the population of students who receive either supplemental or concentration grant funding. So in Stockton, it's 90 percent. In Tracy, it's 56 percent. In our district, it's 25 percent. So then you take the allocation as it is in um, San Joaquin County, and you see how it, it in real communities, um, how it breaks out. And, and when you look at it, most of the communities have been around for well over 100 years, railroad-based, farming-based, gold rush-based. Um, our community being new has a different look. So when you look at the allocation, and again, this is based on the, the latest numbers that are at the state, which is the 13-14 numbers. These numbers will change a little bit when the state finishes its auditing process if for 14-15. But this is where we land per ADA. ADA means average daily attendance, or you can think of it like per child. So when you look at it, this is simply set up as who gets what and the difference between the districts. This is the LCFF funding target. So the governor set this up as a slow rollout. It rolls out to 2012. So when the rollout ends and the, uh, the, uh, the, the amortization goes up, this is where districts are predicted uh, based on these numbers of where we would land. Again, it's possible when the 14-15 numbers come up, we might loop, move up and challenge Jefferson in terms of funding because we went from a K-8 to a K-12 district. However, if you look at it, the difference between Lammersville is here. But if you take the 14-15 average daily attendance or the number of kids we have had then and you apply it to this funding mechanism, you can see the delta or the gap between the amount of funding for these districts where we stand and where the other districts go. But I also do want to point out the reason why Stockton gets so much money is because of those poverty numbers, the English learner numbers, the foster youth numbers. The same applies to all these other districts. So the other responsibility that Alvina's job is based on is meeting multi-year projection responsibilities. The budget um, approval process is audited, it's double audited, it's triple checked, and there are rules. 
And when you do a budget process, many things come forward to the board, but there are qualification titles. Every budget needs to be positively approved. If not, if you fall into qualified or negative status, the very real relationship between a district's budgetary independence and county or state oversight shifts significantly. If we miss our multi-year projection, then I, I worked in a district that had that, then suddenly the county and the state start taking away autonomy. They start overlooking expenditures. They have people look at your books. They come to board meetings and question expenditures. It is our responsibility and our fiscal responsibility to present to you, the board, a responsible budget and make sure that we maintain our always safe, positive um, certification. So the results of LCFF in San Joaquin County are we have to address as a district and as a community the same common core state mandates with significantly less funding than our counterparts in San Joaquin County. And that means per student, per classroom, and per school. So shifting into looking at our district, we also have this amazing community. Uh, we have Lammersville, which is 150 years, or 140 years old. And then we have uh, Wickland that's in its 12th year of existence and everybody, everything else and every building here is, is younger. And as a result of the unique nature of this exurb community, we have lots of things to think about as we deal with our budget. Student population growth, operational costs of building a new school every three to four years. The instructional materials fund was folded into our LCFF al al allocation. We have to build the greatest high school ever, and we're trying as best we can, as fast as we can, as it goes. Um, Calma Core State Standards, professional development, the evolution to 21st century classrooms, program needs of students, desires of the community, technology, technology infrastructure, the long-term impact on all educators of the Great Recession and on our education system, unfunded mandates from the state, and a special education contribution which consistently rises year to year. So this is a very, very simple pie chart, but it does give a, a, a sense of how the LCF money is distributed. We have two pie charts. They show a, a typical year and a year what happens to the pie chart when we open a school. When we open a school, everybody loses a piece of their pie because we have one-time costs to build program, to buy the materials, and all the things that go into starting a school. The blue part of the pie represents certificated classified salaries and benefits. The red piece of the pie is money is invested into classrooms and materials, and the green piece of the pie are operational costs. So let's talk about rapid growth. This is one of the most unique communities in California, frankly, probably the country. In 2012-13, we had four K-8 schools, 91 teachers, 2,228 students. The next year, four schools, 109 teachers, 2,736 students. The next year, Mountain House High School opens with ninth and 10th graders. A fifth elementary school, Altamont, opens, 168 teachers, 3,568 students. This year, Mountain House High School, ninth through 12th graders, though we have a small senior class, five K-8 schools, 185 teachers, and 4,059 students. We are projecting to start 2016-17 with a full set of classes at Mountain House High School with approximately 1,100 students, the largest student population in the Trans Valley League in two years. Five K-8 schools, 200 teachers, 4,500 students district-wide, and we're monitor monitoring Hanson Village and the massive amount of houses that are being built, rapidly, by the way, um, and it's our consideration for when do we start the conversation about applying our plans to build Hanson Elementary. And that leads us into 17 and 18 with Mountain House High School, five schools, and whether or not we start the Hanson Elementary conversation. For people who like line graphs, here you go. That's the same thing. Four schools to six schools, 91 teachers to 200, 185 presently. And... Um, if I had glasses on, I'd be able to say that, but I'm going to say 2428 to 4,500 uh, students, currently 4,059 students in our district. 
We also have upcoming financial liabilities that we have to worry about. The two biggest one I'm going to speak to tonight are the State Teachers Retirement System, or STRS, contribution, and the expiration of a tax, temporary tax called Proposition 30. So if you look up there, um, for those that are, are not reading about this, uh, the California Teachers uh, Retirement System pension liability is $73.7 billion. That means the money that they have and the money that it will amortize up and the amount of money they have to pay out over the next 30 years is in the whole $73 billion. So the, 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 the state and corporate America got together and they came up with a brilliant idea. Why don't we pass this on to LCFF funding? Because that makes sense. We don't have to take the responsibility. We can pass it in through the education system and say, hey, local control. And by the way, you got to pay for that too. This is a, 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 I mean, nothing we can do about it. It was a decision that was made. But the impact on our, our LCFF funds, I'm going to talk about on two horizontal lines. Typically, we've been paying 8.25% um, a contribution to pensions. Starting in 1415 and moving up to 2021, the mandate is to incrementally increase the amount of percentage we give to pensions from 8.25 to 19.98. This horizontal line points out how much LCFF funds are absorbed in that process to that mandate. Last year, it was a $90,000 hit. As we get to 2021, that grows to $2 million. We cannot say no, and the reality is, is all of us that are in STRS, including myself, um, the whole rules about retirement and how much you get paid in your golden years are based on this and what they tell us we have to do. The second one is a temporary tax, Proposition 30, that was created in the midst of the worst recession uh, in our lifetime since probably 1929. And what it originally was was a quarter cent sales tax that was to last 2013 through 2016. And a ta tax on wealthy citizens, individuals making $250,000 or more from 2012 to 2018. That is scheduled to begin to grandfather out starting in 2016-17. And if it expires, then the impact on our LCFF contribution looks like this. We start to lose money on the sales tax expiration here, moving forward, oops, sorry, and, and the income tax expiration here. The total amount is here. So that's the bad news. Those are the worries. That's the exciting part of being a person that represents this school, school district is our hair is on fire. We're constantly building. We're running around trying to make programs for kids. Our teachers are working hard. Everybody wants the best. Our test scores are good, and everything keeps moving. But these are very real financial liabilities that we have to consider as we're doing our work. There is good news. There are two state initiatives in 2016 coming forward that will have an, uh, could have a positive financial impact on our district. The first one is an uh, initiative that just moved forward to extend Proposition 30, and that's being led by the California Teachers Association. And they are a very powerful political action group in our state. So we are very excited about and, and, and root for this to work. The idea in this extension is this. The sales tax will expire on December 31st, 2016. That's over. That's a quarter cent. The tax in this initiative will tax wealthy citizens who, as couples, make 500 k or bigger. And this extension of that tax will last until 2032. It has not qualified for the ballot, and I underline this, yet. They have to go through a signature procedure. They have to get approximately 535,000 signatures. I have every faith that they have the ability to do this. It also is going to be tied as a constitutional amendment. So this means it has lasting power, which is great for education. So the impact of passed is a $6.7 billion annual contribution to the state general fund and the benefit to schools will fall within three to $3.5 billion annually. Now, here's the rub. If Prop 30 is not extended, it doesn't get on the ballot, or if it gets voted down, then the state must pay from its general fund to make up the difference. The problem is it puts the hand in the governor and our legislatures, and depending on the, the quality of our, our budget and the way the economy is, they can do one of many things. They can fully fund it and we'll be in great shape, and all those scary numbers from that earlier slide will cease. 
They could also reduce, reduce the contribution and say, well, you know, we want to give you that much, but we're only going to give you that much. And they could also say, you know what, we can't afford it, we're going to do it, or we funded it differently. So there's a lot of unknowns out there with Proposition 30. The second one is the state uh, ballot initiative being run by the California Schools Boards Association and the California Coalition for Adequate School Housing. That's for state construction bonds. So if you go back to our interest and our, our following of the growth in Hanson Village and our desire and ability to build Hanson Elementary School, this initiative is excruciatingly important to us. There is no existing state construction bond right now. So building schools in our community goes like this. Every village community homeowner pays a Melarus tax. That pays for about 75% of any school we build. The additional 25% comes from state construction bonds, state matching monies. We need a state construction bond to pass to get those monies. So it is very important as we're monitoring the growth of that village that, and watching this initiative that if it passes, $9 billion of a state school construction bond will go forward, and we've already done the paperwork to get the matching funds. So we hope that that passes, and we'll be able to, when we need to build the school, have those funds. The last thing I want to say is, and it's very important that community understands this, LCFF funds do not pay for any building of buildings, but it does pay for the operational costs and the program development in new schools. So there's Hanson Elementary. DSA approved. We've gone through the paperwork process. Everything's ready to go. State construction bond-based initiative is a very, very important factor. And this is what it looks like. Um, all those colors on that map, that's Hanson Village. Those colors represent purchased lots, lots in development. And I promise you, if you drive through there, you will see an amazing amount of buildings being built. So Hanson Elementary School is slated to go right there. And so somehow I keep doing that. Um, and so that's where we're at. So those two initiatives could have a positive impact on our district. LCFF funds pay for programs identified in our LCAP. This is a list of some of them. Future needs and programs that LCFF will contribute to. We still have phase three of Mountain House High School that needs to be developed. And I want to reiterate the point that uh, we, LCFF doesn't build schools, doesn't build buildings, but it does build programs. So when you think of a theater, a library, a media center, voc ed building, aquatic center, career technical ed, and alternative ed programs, those are all programs and buildings that are going to house programs for kids that LCFF funds will contribute to. So the long-term impact. LCFF funds has LUSD at the lowest level of funding in San Joaquin County. Our master plan community is being built out, and we must be prepared to build new schools and programs. Our student population growth is rapid, and growth requires programs that prepare students to be competitive in a global information economy. Our district schools, staff, and teachers are working very hard, and it's very hard, they are working very hard, to provide more with less funding than our counterparts in San Joaquin County. And the results is the leading to an inevitable conversation and comparison to other school districts in our area about the funding they receive. And inevitably, our neighbors across the highway and Tracy Unified are at the centerpiece of that conversation. So LCFF also has, to, has an impact on salaries and benefits. So our current status in our negotiations for salaries and benefits for our Teachers Association. We are currently uh, at impasse. The Teachers Association declared that on September 23rd. The district has been contacted by PERB, Public Employees Relation Board. That's the state regulatory oversight that leads a process when two sides can't get to yes. Um, and it is a long-standing, long-term organization that does these things. And we are presently scheduling through a mediation uh, to try to get to yes with our teachers association. The issue lies between these two sets of facts. The uh, LTA bargaining team has requested a one-year deal for 2015-16 with a 9% salary schedule increase ongoing, $1,000 applied to the benefits cap ongoing. Our challenge is we cannot meet our MYP requirements and pay this amount of money. The district uh, has directed me to offer a two-year deal, 7.5%. In the first year, 2015-16, it's 3.5% ongoing. 3% is on the salary schedule, 
and 0.5%, which is approximately $600, will be applied to the benefits cap of our teachers. In the second year, 16-17, 4% ongoing would go onto the salary schedule. And having done the analysis, the district can meet with this offer our MYP requirements. A side-by-side -side comparison with Tracy, because that is, seems to be the common conversation in the community. I get asked questions about this all the time. Um, can be explained with the lines that are in color. So if you look at the yellow and green lines, that represents the child-based or ADA allocation from the state in the years 13, 14, 14, 15, and the difference between Tracy Unified and Lambersville Unified. The green line represents our current and existing adopted budget, approved budget, and the LCFF allocation. The brown line represents the difference between what Tracy gets per student and what we get per student. And the red line represents if you take the same amount of kids, the ones that we have in our, in our district, and you apply that difference, this is the amount of money that Tracy Unified has to spend above and beyond what we have to spend as a district. That's why I said we're being asked to do the same amount with less funding. And this is the reality when you simply look at the difference over time uh, with what Tracy has to use and what we have to use for people and their needs and programs and their needs. But we are trying to do our best to compete with Tracy with our salaries and benefits comp uh, comp uh, compensation. One of the areas that we outperform Tracy is in teacher benefits. Tracy Unified offers its teachers $8,482 on their benefits cap. Presently, our teachers unit union members are getting $2,510 more, or a total of $10,992. With the offer that we have presented, 10,992 10, becomes 11,592, a difference of $3,010 per teacher. When you compare what T, uh, Tracy Unified puts towards teachers' benefits and what we would in an agreement such as this. But let's look at it in real dollars and LCFF impact. $3,100 times 185 teachers is approximately $575,000. If that amount of money were to come out of the sky and we were to apply that to the salary schedule, that would be the equivalent of approximately 4.77%. The other comparison with Tracy, because it's been talked about a lot out in the community, is our agreement in 1415 compared to our offer compared to what Tracy agreed to. In 2014-15, uh, the, the, the district and LTA agreed to a balancing salary schedule with Tracy Unified. The impact to our LCFF funds was approximately 2.59%. The actual raise per teacher fell within a range, uh, some teachers receiving a very low amount of zero, and some teachers receiving a high amount, 10 to 12%. We also added an additional professional development day, which pays teachers to come to work to get professional development, which is an additional LCFF impact of 0.54%. The tra uh, Tracy Unified had a, a agreement that they agreed upon last spring. That agreement was 7.5%. In trying to keep up with the allocations of Tracy from LCFF and their agreement, they too uh, agreed to 7.5% as we have offered 7.5%. In year one, 2014-15, uh, teachers received 0% in Tracy Unified, and in year two, 15-16, 7.5%. There was no increase to the teacher benefit cap. Tracy Unified went through impasse, mediation, fact-finding to reach this deal. So in conclusion, our MYP responsibilities force our district to thread the needle. We need to meet the needs of a constantly changing community during the greatest era of educational institutional change while building the highest quality 21st century education system possible and taking care of our employees' needs both professionally and personally. And we have to do that with less money from LCFF than our counterparts in the county. Thank you. That's the conclusion of my presentation. Thank you. Questions from the board? Or comments? comments. I do have a question. Um, 
You have an impasse, so you go to the mediation herb. herb. Um, and I'm totally sensitive to the concept that we have to meet our MYP responsibilities, i.e., we can't pay more than we can afford to pay. Correct. Essentially. Um, can PERB make us pay more than we can afford to pay? If No. Okay. Um, it's probably a stupid question, but... No, it's an important question. No, they can't. Um, this was not so much a question. I just want to raise kind of a, from a math guy, it's a math point. If we're looking at next year and the loss of funding that we're going to be seeing from Prop 30 plus the increase just next year, which is a small increase for the um, contribution to PERS, we're looking at approximately a $400,000 hit for the 16-17 school year, correct? Stirs. 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 I'm sorry, PERS. Pa apologize. Apologize. Didn't mean that. I, I was a PERS guy, not a Stirs. <laughs> um, $400,000, if we were able to give that right now as a salary increase, equates to about what? Uh, if I'm reading those numbers correctly, what percent raise would that be for certificated staff? $400,000? Yeah. It's close to 4%. Thank you. My point being that if we didn't have to worry about that $400,000 two years from now, we'd have 4% that we could be looking at on that 7.5 and say, maybe we could do more. It's but the inferior... We have that option, correct? Correct. Correct. We don't. We have to look at the numbers we're anticipating getting, whether the state sits on its butt or actually does something, that's the budget we have to pay today, excuse me, face today two years out. If things change, then we can talk again in the future when that money might or might not be available. The people who are in control of that don't sit up here. They're up in Sacramento. They're the people you need to be talking to about why we get $30,000 approximately less per classroom, why we're looking to lose a half a million dollars two years from now because they're shifting their budget priorities. They're not taking any less money from us in taxes. They're not getting any less money, but they're expecting us to eat their hit rather than the state because they don't want to do it anymore. And it stinks that that has to pass down to you guys. Math. No matter how bad you hate Common Core, math is still math. 2 plus 2 still equals 4, and 10 minus 10 still equals 0. And we can't go past that. I wish we could. I. I have to deal with the realities of our situation. Thank you. I just have two brief things to say. Um, first of all, I'd like the community to really think about what, what, what has been said about Prop 30. Prop 30 was an absolutely spineless effort on the part of the state to put it out to the voters. Prior to that, the governor and the legislature took action, and they said, we need this quarter percent sales tax or whatever it is until that rolled around and they said, oh no, we're not gonna make this decision for our schools and for the education of our children and to try to pay our teachers what they're worth. No, they put it out to the voters. And the voters voted yes, but they put it out to the voters with an expiration date. And that's what we're facing right now. So this is the fault of the governor and the legislature that we have to face this and look at these numbers exactly the way you just said. Um, a piece of information that would help me deal with the numbers and figure out what we can, um, what the difference between the districts are is the cost of our benefits per teacher, per plus one and per family, what the employee contribution is and what the employee contribution in Tracy is because that can make a huge difference to our employees. Compensation, <coughs> compensation is compensation including benefits, yeah. including your, including what you get towards your benefits or how much it costs right. you for your benefits. Right, okay. so if we're giving our teachers $100 but the uh, benefit rates are going up and it's going to hit each of them $125, that's not helping our employees. So that's why I wanna know what is the Go difference ahead. between what our employees have to contribute. I do this, I, I know the differences. It's huge differences in plans in my district. Um, I think Alvina can speak right, to Well, we did compare to the plans that Tracy offers and did find that their most expensive plan was costing a teacher $25,000 per year. For that's one the of cost their... of the plan or that's the employee contribution? Well, you would subtract the $8,400 they're giving, given. So okay. you, the difference between the $25,000 and $8,400 is what the employee is paying out of their pocket. Or $1,500 okay. a month. Fifteen. Mm -hmm. 
dollars $16,000 difference. Thank you, Mr. Numbers, because I can't you. do that. And what about Thank our teachers? Quite. Um, I believe, oh gosh, um, well, there's a variety of plans offered. Right. And I'm, I want to say our highest plan might be about three or four thousand dollars less than that highest plan. So I, because I, I try to take a look, especially at the highest plan that Tracy offered. And like I said, there's quite a few. So there's variable rates depending on what I you choose. I understand that. I would. Uh, respectfully like to request some kind of comparison I will prepare, chart. yes, I will or, do that. And I know we have different plans and people make choices. It was a visual inspection I did, right. so I will, I will compare that. So I'd like to see what does it cost a family, what does it cost an employee plus one, and, and I will check because I have a feeling Tracy offers a composite rate like we do. Mm -hmm. Ours is completely composite. It's composite, okay. with the exception of the, um, the very smallest, the affordable plan which could be an employee plus their children. Right. And that's the only two-tier plan that I think they have available. But I will put something in writing because it was more of a visual inspection than, mm -hmm. than putting in. Okay. And I understand there's difference in plans that are offered, and ours are composite, which tend to be expensive. Mm -hmm. But that's our choice to offer those plans. Correct. And it still matters to the teachers what they have to pay and what they take home. Yes. And I want to know and what their cost is. Traditionally, the family plan costs a lot more and so mm -hmm. districts choose the composite. I know my district our certificated is composite only and I think it's horrible. I will prepare so. that for you. <laughs> okay thank you. I, I do have one follow-on question Dr. Nicholas and that's in in cases where you have money today but you're looking down the road as a district um, it's different than corporate world obviously you're looking down the road well, no, you're, the, the board just tells you to make more money. <laughs> um, the, um, when you're looking down the road and you're, you're looking at the prospect of, I have the money today, but the way the tea leaves are, I can't count on it tomorrow, and I might, A, have additional costs because they're pushing costs down to us, and B, that's exacerbated by... They may, you know, they may give us less and push more costs down. So there's two hits there. Um, the the answer sometimes is, well, okay, we can give you the a raise today, but we can't promise that you will have it the next year and the following year. And that's known as off the correct off schedule off one time off mm -hmm. schedule off schedule. Okay, and we have. During the process of negotiations, we talked about that and we offered off schedule, you know, saying, hey, we understand. We just can't commit to it on ongoing years. How about this? And Correct. We, um, we, we had a conversation and we were asked not to offer any monies off the schedule, just on the schedule. Okay. Asked by? In the negotiation. Thank you. Okay. The other thing I want to say is, is what we, what we, our process was, uh, if you look at the history of the, of, of the district and how it's compensated employees, both, both certificated and classified, um, slow incremental growth over time each year has been the pattern. And um, what we tried to do is with all of these factors that we're considering is to try to build into the budget something that was in the spirit of, of, the, of the past, which has been 2% uh, here, 3% there, health benefits in, increase there over time has been the practice in the district going back, at least in what I looked at was about 10 years. But that's the best thing that I know to do and that we know to do in, in a good economic time with all of these financial liabilities coming down the pike. I mean, I like that. I've been on this board for a long time. I, you know, 2006, 2008, I was on the elementary board, took a little break while I went next door. Worst Sorry years of my life. <laughs> <laughs> and then I've been back on the unified board since 2010. And I can say with pleasure that this district's never laid anybody off. Even during the worst economic downturn, we never laid anybody off. And our neighbors can't say that. Alvina, I'd like to commend you on your effort because I know how hard you work mm -hmm. on making sure these numbers are correct. How many years in advance when we sub submit the MYP do we have to forecast? Well, the current year and two years out. Two years out. So we always have to be looking at how things are going to change in the next two years. And being fiscally responsible is something that this district takes very seriously, always has, and I'm very proud of that. I don't think we have had, even before I started here in 2006, we have ever had anything but a positive certification, even with the growth, even during the budget cuts. And the other thing is um, 
We have a lot of programs and those cost money as well. And since I've been on this board, when I talk to parents, the theme that I usually hear is we want more, more rigor. We want gate. We want all these programs. And unfortunately, a lot of these programs cost money. So um, difficult times. Yeah. Any further comments? I'll, add, I'll just want to add one more thing. And this for me, I'm hoping, I'm hoping that people see this not as someone saying someone's cheap, someone saying someone's greedy. This is a simple function of this is what we can do. This is what we have. This is what's out there. Again, it's really just about math. This isn't about trying to punish one side or blame one side or any of those things from my perspective. This is simply, look, folks, we have a pot of money. We have to spend only so much of it. We're not allowed in the corporate world. We can, you can lose $40 million to pay salaries and bonuses and everything else. We can't lose a cent. We can't be negative. It's just not allowed. And I, I, wish, I wish we had a simple solution to this. And I'm going to talk more about this later. But in the end, this is complicated. And I'm hoping that people hear what we're trying to say, which is work with us. We're trying. There's a lot going on here besides this. This is a piece of the puzzle. Let's all focus on the fact that none of this exists outside the rest of it. And here when we're saying, I'm saying, because I can't speak for everybody else, I'm saying this isn't blame, this isn't fault, this is just fact. Ida B, quarterly reports on the Williams uniform complaints for July 2015 through October 2015. There are none. Item C, District <laughs> Maintenance and Operations Report. Alvina? Okay, no gophers. Yes. At least we've had those under control. Knock on wood. I did hear of raccoons, though, at Bethany, yes. and the director of maintenance reported to me that we had paid a company to come and put traps out, and they're required to come out within 24 hours to pick them up. And when the company came out to pick them up, someone had released the raccoon and locked the gate so we could no longer trap the raccoon. <laughs> so they maybe we need to publicize that we're not going to hurt the raccoons. We're yes, just going think, to move I them. Think, yes, we definitely need. <laughs> to to raccoons are known to kill cats and small yes. dogs. I mean, I don't think people. I don't know who was that. brave enough to go and let it out in the There's first no place. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, and then I, I I did get a note. Um, Lori Robertson had mentioned that there may be some issues with the fuel that's inside the Altamont track. So I'll. I'm going to go check that out. I think it's from use. Yeah, it's probably just And the problem. lack of rain and, mm -hmm. yes, so taking a look at that. And then I had a great notification from the Northern California chapter. They have given to the um, contractor who did the Col well, Collins Electrical work over at the high school project, gave a Project Excellence Award. And Noelle is going to put up the picture of the work that they did at, at Mount House High School. Of course, they wanted to acknowledge the latest technology and lighting controls, communications, and safety systems. So I thought that was nice and wanted to share that, that they won a, an award for it. Thank you. And publicized it. I actually love that change. It's gorgeous. It's awesome. That's it. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, committee reports, item A's facility use uh, for the board. The uh, last meeting minutes are attached to the packet. If you have any questions. Item B, District Advisory Committee. Have not met. Okay. Item C, District English Language Advisory Committee. I defer to Mr. Clements. We, we did meet last week. Um, we had three parents in attendance. Um, last week was formative, the first meeting of the year. We discussed um, the setup and process for the coming year, and most of the conversation after that was discussed uh, was on how to increase um, parent involvement and there does seem to be some question on the best times. And if the DLAC decides to do it during the middle of the day, I'm really going to struggle, um, which I think parent attendance is really important sure. on that committee. Um, you know, I'm just confessing to the board that if it's in the middle of the day, I'm going to... There won't it's be any be board members there that are currently... Well, I'm not going to say none, <laughs> but, yeah. you know, they got to do what they got to do. But I'm, hope, I'm still hopeful that I can still attend. So I'd just like to add to that, um, struggling to get parents to a DLAC committee are not 
odd. So one of the suggestions I made to Mr. Seamus, who ran a great meeting um, and really listened to all of the suggestions, was to start to occasionally run a meeting in one of our major home languages. We have over 20-something languages in this district. We can't run meetings in all of them. But <clears throat> to hit some of our major languages, and maybe the parents will feel more comfortable coming to a meeting that is run in their home language. I recently participated in a meeting as the non-majority, and I was on the headphones and not listening to an English speaker. It was a very interesting experience. So I can understand why parents want to have the meeting done in their own language. So we're gonna keep talking and see what we can do to address that and get more parents out at those meetings so they can understand the programs that we're implementing for their children to acquire better English skills. Or perspective. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, item D, gate, arts, and music. The, the next meeting is, the first meeting for the year is Tuesday, October 13th. Okay. Uh, item E, safety and crisis, is there anything else? I'm sorry. No, okay. Uh, safety and crisis response. Uh, Dr. Gill and I met with the new fire chief and our school resource officer to talk about, um, just kind of catch up, talk safety, talk about a drill in the future, and getting um, both of those individuals active with the committee. Our next committee meeting is listed on the agenda, and I think that was about it. Anything else, Kush? Anything else? Okay. Um, and item F is wellness. Um, our next wellness committee meeting will be Tuesday, October 14th, and Wednesday, October 14th. And again, thank you for all the board members' participation, all these committees. I know there's a lot going on, a lot of different events, so it's, it's important for you to be there. Thank you. Uh, next item is governing board reports. So I would like to begin um, by saying that for the next governing board meeting, I had a personal issue, so I'm not going to be at that one. So I apologize for that in advance. And then um, secondly, I wanted to briefly mention um, the... Um, the, I, wanted, uh, I wanted to briefly mention one of the Mount House High School um, coaches. She um, recently left, and I do not believe that her her leaving should be in silence. So I just wanted to briefly say she was the um, dance coach, and she didn't just care about teaching every single girl on the team dance and um she, she had a great passion for it, but she also had a passion and she deeply cared for every single girl on the team and really cared for all of us as people. And um, we were all, as a member of the dance team, we were all de devastated with her leaving. However, we will continue, hopefully continue, and bring out more performances for upcoming games and for the rest of the season. Samantha, would you like to tell the public what her name is? Yes, her name is Coach Fuller. <laughs> Thank you. Trustee Clemens. Uh, since the last school board meeting, I had the opportunity to visit Lammersville and Bethany Elementary. Um, and I had a chance to speak one-on-one -on -one with quite a number of teachers. The principals were um, kind enough to allow me to select the classes that I went to. So um, the it wasn't like the visits were choreographed. They were with me, but it wasn't like those visits were choreographed. Um, I did appreciate the candor um, with which the teachers told me the things that were going well, as well as the challenges that they were facing um, in the district. Um, I mean, we all know that the teachers um, are in the classroom because they care very deeply and they want to educate our children um, uh, excuse me, our student the scholars, the best that our scholars can be educated. So I wanted, I did want to take the moment and say thank you to the teachers for the hard work that they do. I wish I could say that that those conversations, you know, the obstacles that teachers are facing were universal. There was one obstacle and that I knew exactly how to proceed and, and had the solutions for the district. Um, you know, unfortunately, while there were a few common threads to those discussions, um, 
you know, very frequently the obstacles were classroom by classroom, grade by grade, um, RCD unit by RCD unit. Um, and so I, I don't know. So I'm very, as I understand it, we're going to be comparing calendars, and I'm very um, excited about um, working with the board to schedule a, you know, a, a Brown Act meeting where we can discuss this and move forward. Um, I am also grateful for the opportunity to attend the Foundations of Effective Governance. Um, I did that with Trustee Lampel um, a, a couple of weeks ago. And I'm also looking forward to attending student learning and achievement as well as policy and judicial review, which are the next two components in the Masters in Governance series. Um, I believe these classes will definitely help me to be a effect, more effective board member. Um, and I think that our teachers, students, staff deserve no less than the best board member that I can possibly be. So thank you very much for allowing me to do that. Um, finally, I wanted to say that I think that it's easy when you hear comments, you know, public comments like last week, or you see, read stuff in Facebook, it's easy to focus a little bit myopically on that issue. And as important as that issue is, I want to point out that I am proud of the work that this board and this district and the staff and the teachers are doing. And that, you know, I think that, you know, as it relates specifically to my fellow board members, I think we work well together as a board. Um, we don't always agree, but we respect each other's opinion, and no one takes it personally when others don't vote our way. So I wanted to say that I am proud to be on this board in this district with each and every one of you. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Nielsen. change, I actually sat down and wrote down my comments because I wanted to make sure I didn't miss anything. Uh, I'm going to start off first to uh, to Dr. Nicholas, to President Balsarini and the rest of the board with an apology, which I seem to be doing way too often recently. Um, the board has a policy regarding social media and in frustration, I posted comments that could have been seen as a statement on behalf of this entire board. Once again, I let my heart get ahead of my head, and for that I apologize. And I'm going to tell you, I'm going to do my best to do better. I'm, I'm really going to try. I, I am. Um, to that, since the last meeting, I conducted a town hall style meeting that I previously mentioned uh, at the last meeting, and we'll, have, we'll discuss a little bit more on that later. But based on some of the feedback I got at the meeting, I wanted to share it. These are the letters that I received from the teachers. I haven't read them all yet. I'm still in progress. It's quite a few. Um, based on the feedback that I got, I also had a meeting with Dr. Nicholas and Mrs. Sherburn about some of the issues raised by parents and staff, particularly as it relates to curriculum and RCD to get their feedback. I plan as a next step to conduct some meetings with the district principals and vice principals so that I can get feedback from their perspective on the issues facing the district. And then after that, I plan to conduct school site visits throughout November and December uh, to visit teachers in the classroom as well as I promised. For the remainder of my report and the bulk of my report, at this point, Dr. Nicholas and Mr. President, my report is entire. I'm exhausted. I sat down to try to figure out how to detail these things so that everybody would understand, but the truth is I'm not sure that there are some people who want to hear it. I have to keep trying, though. I, I, I in the end, I refuse to give up. I'm going to honor my commitment to this board, to this community. What's frustrating me, what's wearing me out is the apparent lack of realization in some quarters that the issues that we're facing are complex and interrelated. It appears from my perspective that anything we say up here at this point isn't going to have any real impact because apparently we can't condense it to a Facebook post. However, I'm left with the same problem and how to explain this in a way that makes sense. As I mentioned earlier, I, went to, I had the opportunity to meet with parents and staff, mostly teachers, at a town hall meeting I conducted two weeks ago tonight. At the meeting, I was, here, I was able to hear from many perspectives the concerns of the teachers and some parents. Some of these concerns were salary, curriculum, testing, and staffing levels. Each of these items has been on a recent agenda or was on the agenda for tonight's meeting. But according to the Facebook crowd, unless we have a specific agenda item that says teacher morale, we apparently don't believe that exists. I guess trying to address all of the concerns just isn't good enough. I know for a fact that there have been discussions about placing a joint meeting, Brown Act meeting, 
between LTA and board members, and that that continues. Why that meeting hasn't taken place, I'll leave for President Balzarini to address or not. But for one, I want to say this. If we're going to fix the problems that this district faces, we must not silence any voices. We must be willing to hear from every single stakeholder, whether we like what they have to say or not, because it's important to hear from everyone everything we're dealing with. <laughs> this part I might actually lose it on. During my town hall meeting, I was able to, sense, to see the sincere dedication of some of the teachers as they discussed not how this issue impacted them, rather how it affected their students. To see these dedicated teachers break down when discussing not their wallets, not their pride, but their students and how it was affecting them was as impactful as anything I have ever experienced as a board member. To see those teachers break down when talking about their students' frustrations with MAP and the curriculum and all the rest of it was, was very moving. But when it came down to solutions, things got a little murky. It seems to me that some of the folks in the Facebook crowd and some of the parties in this situation would rather hear there's an easy fix to this. I heard things, for example, like, give me my 9% or get rid of so-and-so. Some people want something that'll fit on a campaign button, but as often as we say this is a much larger and more complex issue, those words just appear to fall on deaf ears. So to that end, I wanna provide a little bit more perspective. One of the solutions that was proposed by a person in attendance was that I should make all of my fiscal decisions with the understandings that teachers should be my first priority. I was flat out told teachers should be your first financial priority. And to me, that seems simple. I'm guessing if I ask all the folks in blue out there, you're going to agree that you should be my first financial priority. Many of the parents may agree as well. So let's just say I do that, that I make teachers my first priority. That begs a question. Who's last? Who's second? Who's third? How do I start ranking principals, secretaries, clerical staff, and most importantly, where do I rank students? In the end, the only way we get this done, the only way we resolve this is to recognize who our real priorities are. My answer to that statement at the town hall meeting, my answer remains that it is my job to weigh all of our responsibilities. We must not prioritize one group over another. We must consider the impact of all our decisions on every aspect of what is we do. How does it affect the budget, staffing needs, future plans, and most of all, how does this benefit our students? And I'm gonna tell you the truth, I stole that line from this person to my left. <laughs> that is something that this board keeps as a mantra on a regular basis. In the end, how does this decision affect our students? And I believe that that is important for me to remember as a board member what it is we do here. We educate our students. So to that, I'm gonna say this. To the old man seated two seats to my right, I promise you, and all of the students in this district, that I will continue to focus on the entire set of issues this district faces. I promise to work diligently to find solutions to these problems. And I will say that teachers who met with me and expressed a sincere desire to find solutions focusing on the needs of your students, I'm not gonna give up on finding those solutions. I make the same promise to her and to you. But I'm not attempting to speak for the entire board. However, I happen to believe honestly that each one of the members up on this dais share the same dedication and we are all be working together to fulfill these promises that I just made on my own behalf. I believe that each one of them makes all of their decisions based on what they feel is in the best interest of our students. And while they may not be simple, I know that we will continue to work together to find those solutions. Last Monday, this last Monday, I was invited to meet with the Quest to School Foundation to discuss many topics. Really, it was supposed to be a discussion of the Brown Act. Not surprisingly, and I didn't mind at all, the mood of the district was brought up by some of the parents. I hope I was able to convey to the parents in attendance some of the complexities that we're facing. But during that meeting, a member of the audience who has no affiliation to the school district, to the school board, is not a staff member, is not a parent, got up and, and now outlined to the audience that many of the problems we're facing are not unique to this district. In fact, he travels throughout the country giving presentations to school districts 
on what he does. And he stood up and mentioned the same issues in curriculum that we're facing, the same teacher shortages we're facing. He's, he heard in Chicago, New York, Boston. In the end, the entire country is experiencing these issues. And to ignore that any of these separate issues don't link up together, I believe are going to result in failure. I think it is vital that we recognize that this is much bigger than that. And I understand most of you probably don't want to hear this. I get it isn't as simple as put it on the agenda or it isn't happening, or as, easy, or as catchy as you can't put students first if you put teachers last. But I will tell you, neither one of those statements is true. I, and I believe everyone here on this dais recognizes the issues we're facing, and as board members, none of us ever have put teachers last. We don't do it now, and we won't ever. We must face the hard reality of what we can do with what we have, just like Dr. Nicholas presented in our budget situation, to meet our goals. If we refuse to recognize our abilities and our limitations, we're doomed to fail. For those of you who didn't like what I have to say, a year from now, my seat is up for election. At that time, you can feel free to replace me with someone who has the simple solutions if that's what you prefer. But for the next 14 months, I'm going to honor my dedication to the teachers who focused on the needs of their students when we met. I'm going to remember the promise I made to you today and to Ms. D. Tiberius and the other students in this district. In conjunction with my fellow member, board members and anyone willing to do the hard work in front of us, I'm going to work my tail off to find solutions. I look forward to, willing, I look forward to working with those of you willing to do the same. And with that, I end my report. I will. I've read most of them already. And by the way, I, I appreciate the outburst. It's very professional. Trustee Nantel, thank you. OK. Um, let's see. So as uh, Trustee Clements reported, that we uh, attended the uh, Master's in Governance class. It was an excellent class. The worst part was the commute home from Visalia. Oh. <laughs> That's a long drive. <laughs> um, we went to the football game. There's great spirit out there. Our kids are coming together. They, they will get there. They give it their all. They are an amazing group of youngsters. Um, at the football game, I had the honor to meet our school resource deputy. And kudos to the interview team. I was not on that team. You made an excellent, excellent decision. He is fabulous. He is so focused on the students and their needs as they grow into young adults. He, just fabulous. I really he enjoyed it. He was a teacher, right? Yes, he did mention that. Yeah. Yeah, I said, wow, so you, you got the picture. You, you know. So he's not just a police officer off the street who said, oh, I'll get off the streets for a little while and go work in the schools. He really knows what he's doing. Mm -hmm. He was a teacher. I think his, his wife is a teacher or some, some family member is a teacher. And um, he, he sees the big picture. So what a fabulous addition to our school, our schools, because he does service all of the schools, not just the high schools. Um, I will, I have been listening to the teachers and the public. I've had uh, communications with teachers, communications with parents, um, and at the suggestion of, I think it was the Teachers Association, I will be making school visits in the near future. I am not announcing them because I don't want to see a dog and pony show. You all know I am an educator. I want to see what's really going on out there. I will contact the principals a little bit in advance so they know to expect me. But we were asked to go to the schools without district administration. So I arranged for a vacation day, and that's exactly how I'm spending my vacation day because I am dedicated to this district. I'd rather use a vacation day to go to the beach, but this is important. Um, I'm not saying that because I want you to feel sorry for me. I don't mind using a vacation day for this. It is important, and that's why I'm on this board. But I think some people need to know that things like this can be difficult if you have to take a day off of your job to visit the schools. But we're doing it because we're here for a reason, and that's to make things the best for the kids and to meet the needs of our staff as best as possible considering the presentation on the finances that we heard. Um, and I will keep my comments brief tonight. So. 
I would like to start off by saying I too went to the high school football game. I very much enjoy them. My son plays for the JV team and I find the games very entertaining. I went to the games last year when my son didn't play yet because he was an eighth grader, but I still found them very, very entertaining. Um, I had the pleasure today of spending pretty much my entire day, well, until I got here at least, uh, <coughs> visiting a couple of our school sites. I visited Bethany this morning and walked a lot of classrooms, met and talked with a lot of the teachers and got some some good insights. I uh, talked with a lot of students and administrators as well. I even had uh, cafeteria lunch, which not surprisingly was quite tasty. Then I spent the afternoon at Wickland and met met with a lot of additional teachers and talked with them and students and it was it was enlightening I enjoyed it um, now I'm going to talk about something that's been bothering me for three weeks since our last our last board meeting at our last board meeting on September 16th the parents spoke from the podium there and in the co course of her speaking she questioned the validity of an opinion of our student that our student board member had expressed. I feel that questioning the, the validity of an opinion of a student sent here by her peers to represent them on this board was completely inappropriate. Everyone is entitled to an opinion. We don't have to agree with it, but questioning the validity of that opinion based on the age, job status, or ability to financially contribute is not right. I don't think that standing behind that podium, sitting behind a keyboard and posting on Facebook, or sitting behind this dais gives any of us the right to treat anyone disrespectfully. I believe that all of us, board members, district staff, teachers, parents, and students, need to remember to treat each other with respect, not only here in this room, but always. And if anybody doesn't know the, the um, incident that I'm speaking of, you can find it at our on our last board meeting recording at the two hour and 22 minute mark. Thank you. Um, so on Monday, um, I came here, I started off my day here at the district office, I was able to actually see a, a, one of the RCD planning lessons take place with the second grade uh, group and was in awe. I walked in and uh, they had that side, that half of the boardroom blocked off and papers on the wall, projector on, working through uh, Google Docs and it, it was very impressive and um, I got to see some passion and one of the teachers told me um, to have the ability to create your own curriculum is awesome and that there's a lot of collaboration with RCD, um, and it's really sparked my interest. I, I don't know enough about it. I'll admit that. And I will do what I can to make sure that I uh, get myself quickly educated on RCD. In fact, I'm in the process working with the superintendent. We're going to have a board presentation on RCD for, for our own edification, so we all are on the up and up and know what's going on. Um, I also visited Wickland. Elementary and Cuesta Elementary went through some of the classrooms. Um, I walked in and just observed. I, I didn't really interact with anyone. I just wanted to kind of see what was going on. I saw teachers teaching, teacher, teachers teaching and students learning, and it was, um, you know, the, the classrooms uh, looked great. Everyone had their objectives up on the board, and, um, you know, it was, it was good to see. Kind of uh, refreshes myself as to why we're up here and what we're doing. As far as uh, our superintendent's presentation, something he said many times I think needs to be kind of refreshed in everyone's mind is that the state has given us common core, and he has said so many times that they're building, you know, we're building the plane while we're flying it. And I, I think that that's been forgotten, that this whole process, they've, they've turned everything we know about education upside down. And I, you know, I, I sit on the board of directors for the California School Board Association. I'm in Sacramento at minimum once a month. And 
every single board member from all over the state, we have 28 of them, um, have the same complaints. We had a person from um, the California Office of Education come and give a presentation on the uh, new state testing, the, the was it CASP? CASP. CASP? And I felt so bad for that person because the entire board just attacked them. <laughs> because everyone feels the same frustration that our teachers are feeling. I assure you, teachers all over the state, board members all over the state, feel what you're feeling. This frustration of um, this pill that the state and federal government is making us swallow called Common Core. And making us start it without curriculum established and having to navigate this process that we have. So uh, I understand. Uh, I've received a few emails and letters from teachers and um, I hear you. And as far as this meeting, uh, we will be sitting on the calendar today. We'll get something set up for next week. And uh, let's address this morale issue and hear some of the specific issues with RCD and talk about it, not necessarily the way I would like to, Personally, my personal opinion, I think that should be handled offline with the district. But if the desire is to have it in a Brownock meeting with the full board, so be it. We'll do it. So we'll get that calendared um, later in the, on the agenda. And I guess that's all I really have. President Belzerini, I left out something very important because my notes were a mess. If you don't mind, I'd Please. like to add something. Um, in my communication, with, especially with teachers, over the past few weeks, it came to my attention that many teachers felt that the apology from the board was not sufficient for being reprimanded publicly for talking about what was going on in negotiations. The board was given incorrect information and then expressed an opinion to the teachers. So I would like to sincerely apologize for that. It was a human error. It was not purposeful. The board was not misled on purpose. It was just an error but I would like to publicly apologize to the teachers for the statements that were made. It was a mistake. There was no confidentiality agreement, and we just need to move on from there. But I did feel bad for the teachers that took offense to the comments that came from the board about that issue. And while we may not have a written confidentiality clause, I can tell you from years of service on this board, that there was always an understanding of confidentiality. And that's where the error came yeah. from. And, and yes. that's, and yeah, so that's, that's yeah. thank you for clarifying that. Anything further? No. Action items, item A, consider approval of updated 2015-16 inter-intra district transfer requests. Any staff report? None. No. Move to approve updated 2015-2016 inter-intra district transfer request. Second. <clears throat> All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Item B, consider approval of governing board letter of support on Assembly Bill 288, College and Career uh, Access Pathways Partnerships. Staff report. So uh, I was uh, contacted by the dean of school over at uh, Mountain House Delta Campus, uh, and this is a, a assembly bill in support of making a smooth uh, successful run for districts seeking partnerships with uh, ju junior colleges and community colleges, as is our program that uh, Ben Fobert and, and Team High School are putting together for our kids this year. That's cool. I like it. <laughs> Great stuff. Thank you for, for being a part of that. Uh, with the board's permission, I would also like to add a CC for uh, Assembly Member Eggman and Senator Galgiani, since they are our representatives. And whoever did the actual writing of the letter did a very nice job. I'll send that compliment to that person. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Any board discussion? I just want to add that um, in reading some of the letters that I received from the teachers, there were some concerns about that program being a trick, a show by the high school. And I just want to say this isn't something we're doing on our own. This is something that the state is trying to suggest as a good opportunity for our high school students. And I, 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 again, these are the kinds of things that we as a community, I think, should support and should love and that as teachers, we should appreciate opportunities to push and give our students an, a chance to excel. And for the students who don't want to, they don't have to take advantage of that opportunity. But we should give all of our students every single opportunity 
to succeed, and I'm glad we are. And I will move to approve Governing Board Letter of Support on Assembly Bill 288. And I will second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Information discussion items, item A, Mountain House Developers. Mr. Sergeant? Oh, go ahead, <laughs> Superintendent. <laughs> so I was I promised not to talk. <laughs> Uh, Dave, Dave Sargent sent me an email today uh, apologizing for not being able to attend this evening representing Mountain House developers, but he did send me some information regarding uh, the lacking of landscaping along Central Parkway and Mustang Way uh, surrounding our high school. So here is uh, my notes as follows. Um, they were not able to install the landscaping over the summer because the plans had not been approved by the CSD. The approval process was stalled because of the drought and potential CSD changes in landscaping and irrigation practice. New state regulations are in conflict with the Central Parkway original design for turf use, and that seems to be the place where it's stalled. CSD is trying to figure out um, a way to have turf, irrigate, and meet that regulation, um, and that is creating a delay. Um, so the plan moving forward, Mountain House developers and CSD want to complete improvements around high school, high school uh, at, around the high school, I'll say that, try to sound, that, sound articulate there, sorry, uh, want to complete improvements around the high school. The proposal is for the CSD to phase high school landscaping along Mustang Way as soon as possible. A schedule will be forthcoming. Uh, if Central Parkway water issue drags on in terms of the approval process of a plan, then um, they have promised to place mulch in the uh, areas until there is a approved plan where they can put in landscaping, uh, which means irrigation systems and the like. Uh, that yeah, came to me yesterday afternoon. I would like to jump in since my esteemed colleague said he wasn't going to speak. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> That's all that was. This. This, this is garbage, this response, and I'm sorry to be so blunt. This is absolute garbage. They landscaped across the street. <laughs> we had that. All the way down the street. All the way down the street. We had that discussion. This is blah, blah, blah. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. We're going to do the other thing, and we're still waiting. It's October. I, I can't say anymore. They I, said they, said they were going to. Okay. <laughs> Trustee Lampel, they said they were going to do it over the summer. They didn't say which summer. Oh, that's a very good point. Very good point. <laughs> um, I have concern about if they put mulch in, because they've done this in the past. They use cheap mulch, and guess what? Away. It's windy. It blows away in two minutes. Yes. It so, appears that shredded cedar is the mulch de jour, because that's what they've been putting around town, just because okay. you can see it. Well, if they turn off the windmills, the, the wind won't blow it away. <laughs> okay. Nice. I like I just I would just want to ask one question that was when when the deci not not if this this is a rhetorical question more than anything. When it was determined that the plans weren't going to be approved, we were contacted. It's not we were contacted when that the plans were going to be approved and therefore the work would not be done. We were contacted yesterday afternoon. Yeah, yesterday afternoon. <laughs> After we contacted. <laughs> yes, <That> thank you. <laughs> and I wish you would have let me answer that, because I could have <laughs> predicted that one. I like, correct the record. Actually, I spoke to the gentleman last week, so that's well, and I apologize. I don't know. You've said something here that's kind of sparked my interest, because coming from the CSD board, I know that if there's going to be any sort of design changes as far as what kind of all that kind of land, that's going to require uh, an update to the plan, which I believe has to be approved by the county. Well, yeah, you're right. So because it's a, an amendment of the master plan. So, okay, we'll wait and see. This will be interesting. Um, you, and by that, you mean continue to wait and see? Yes, absolutely. Okay, item B is a Mountain House High School Challenge Day, November 3rd. Principal Colbert. Um, being passed down to you right now are some invitations to our challenge day. Um, as you know, last year we engaged in our very first challenge day, and I'd like to just go through uh, again for you um, what challenge day is. So the vision of challenge day is that every ch child lives in a world where they feel safe, loved, and celebrated. And the history of this organization called Challenge Day, it was created in 1987. It was a response to bullying and increasing school violence and declining academic success. And um, it's a day-long experiential workshop that is participated in by students, teachers, parents, and other adults. So 
you'll see the purposes up there on the screen. Um, I won't read through them, but it's a great program that has a lot of great outcomes. Um, after our first year, we, we started a Be the Change Club that's still going this year, led by our head counselor, Karen Friesen. So we, we did a recent school-wide survey that indicates about 35% of our students have experienced bullying at school. And um, we're excited to bring it back this year. Um, and our students from the Be the Change Club are excited to add more peer advocates to their ranks because we have uh, that many students participating in it each year. Each year increases the number of students who've been through the Be the Change. We don't have kids go again the following year because we want more and more students to become trained and have this experience. So up to 100 students from a cross section of the high school demographics and cliques. And that includes uh, your popular kids, your not so popular kids, the bulliers and the bullied. Um, up to 25 adults, including school, faculty, staff, parents, and community members, which is where you come in and why you have an invitation for you there. Um, any and all of you who would like to come uh, on our challenge day, and if the date is there, I think it's November 3rd. 3rd. <laughs> it is a full day. But we also have, we invite our 7th and 8th grade ambassadors from our uh, elementary schools and two adult leaders from each elementary school to take the message back to the middle school students. It is a seven through 12 program. Um, and they have done that. They did that last year and started uh, small things last year. Getting more kids into it this year will help to spread that message as well. Um, there is a cost to the program. It's $3,300 for the fac facilitation and we need funds for a full day substitute for each adult who is a teacher um, to participate. This year we actually did get permission from our um, sheriff to have our school resource officer participate in challenge day, which will be really great. He'll be Wonderful. in a soft uniform as opposed to Good. the full uniform. I've participated in challenge day before with SROs and it's, an, it's awesome to have them there. These kids really do make connections. I made connections with a couple of kids last year that I would never had made connections with before. And they still say hi to me this year and high five me and all that kind of stuff. So it's really nice to, to participate in that program with the kids. So um, these are some numbers that Challenge Day reports. And I would say that they're absolutely true. About 90% of the students who participate in Challenge Day report being more aware of the effects of bullying on others, accepting and supporting of other students, um, understanding of other people's experiences, aware of that their actions affect others and they're likely to help others. That is totally true. Um, one of the students I'm thinking of was totally closed off to other students, not caring at all, and I've seen a complete change around in that student that continues to this day. They are the person that steps in among that group of kids to say, hey, this is enough. So it's great. Uh, it's a great day. Um, and we invite you to come, as many as you have, as want to come. Are there any questions? Not so much a question as a comment, because I did participate in this last year. And I will say that I misspoke earlier when I said, well, not misspoke. Um, this was the single most powerful thing I have ever experienced as a school board member. I broke down in tears about a half a dozen times. <laughs> both for myself, talking about my past, which was selfish, but that's part of the day, and hearing from these other kids. But if you really want to know how powerful this is, and, and Mr. Colbert was there with us, to hear a student get up when he allowed, when the presenters allowed them to, to just openly talk and say, I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know I was a bully. And I promise now not to be a bully. I don't care what this costs. If we can hit that one student every single year, we can reduce bullying. We have other kids. It is, uh, if you can participate, any of you, please go to this day because it will affect you. And I would just like to echo Trustee Nielsen's, <laughs> sorry about that, Trustee Nielsen's comments. I too participated in this event last year and it was very powerful. I shed a few tears myself, and in fact, I believe we shared a hug yes, at one point. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> Not on camera anywhere, but we did. <laughs> it's, it's a really good program. The, I believe the kids get a lot out of it. I got a lot out of it. it. It teaches empathy on a level that I don't think is, is taught enough Thank today. Yeah. And I, I really, I would say I enjoyed it, but it was 
It was a very powerful day. Intense. It was intense. I just want to say I'm glad that it's here. Thank you for bringing it to us. Thank you for facilitating this. This is uh, something that's absolutely needed on every campus, every high school campus, and I'm, I'm glad it's here. So thank you. So am I, and I'm, I didn't get to go last year. I'm really glad we're having it again this year, and I really want to, I really want to attend this year. I'm going to try. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you said that students aren't allowed to go again. Are board members allowed to? Board members are again? allowed because the, the ac actually adult facilitators who go a second time are even more useful because you know what the experience is like and it makes it even better for the rest of, of the students and the adult participants. Because it, it does make adults really have to get out of their comfort zone Boy, and be real cheerleaders for what's going on during that day. Well, and I'm really excited to see how um, our, our deputy interacts with this whole thing. I, I'm, I'm excited yeah. to hear about it. Good. And, and hearing that board members can go a second year, I'm going to try to make it in if I can. Some of you, if you make it, you might get to give, give me a hug as well. <laughs> well, that's, that's a reason to go all in itself. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, item C is the annual San Joaquin County School Board Dinner, Monday, November 16th. I'm guessing you need names. Been able to go to because school is over, I will happily be able to attend. Oh, steak. <laughs> um, I can't remember. What was the date again? November 16th. 16th. It's also my first day of golf last time. Oh. So I'll enjoy dinner as a break. I'll need to get back to you. When, when do we have to know by? End of the month. I'm on my way home okay. from Florida. I'll get back to you. I got to switch off. Ginny and I, Ginny and I will both go and I'll reimburse the district for her ticket. Mm -hmm. I can't make it. I'll be in the friendly skies that day. <laughs> and I plan, I plan to attend, and I will. My dinner choice would be beef. Oh yeah, beef for me too. Yeah. And item D is dear graduation. On my travels at Wickland on Monday, I ran into Officer Abs and. He would not let me leave the room until he made sure that we were going to make sure everyone knew about the dates and if it's possible that he would like to have you at the graduation. So the dates are listed. Uh, next item is calendar. Um, our next regular board meeting is on Wednesday, October 21st. And shortly we'll be adjourning to closed session for several items. Item A, public employee discipline, dismissal, release, complaint. Item B is conference with labor negotiators. Item C, Government Code Section 54956.9, Conference with Legal Counsel, Anticipated Litigation, or Exposure to Litigation. And item D is Conference with Group Harper Negotiators. Do I have a motion? Do you not want to do the calendar? I mentioned it. Is there anything the specific? calendaring yeah, yeah. of the meeting. the meeting. Yes, let's do that. Thank you yes. very much. I wanted to make sure we didn't miss it. So, um, some, uh, additionally on a calendar, next week I'd like to schedule a workshop-style Brown Act board meeting. LTA has been invited, uh, when we come up with a date, to discuss uh, some of the recent discussions we've had with the board, morale, and some of the curriculum issues that teachers are facing. So, calendars, please. The, the, well, only, the only night next week that I don't have a meeting at night is Wednesday, but if everybody else is available on a different night, I will attend said meeting and miss whatever other meeting I have scheduled. Wednesday's and something I, good for me. Something I want to bring up, uh, there was a meeting scheduled for Tuesday. Tuesday, which I was advised it's a very light agenda and that can be rescheduled if we would like to use that date. Well, it's the gate, for Tuesday. Oh, the, the gate, gate committee. Yeah, I have a board meeting at work Tuesday, so I can't okay, do Okay, Tuesday's no good. Night. Wednesday. I'm available Wednesday. I'm oh, sorry, Wednesday you are available? Wednesday's good. Any day. Wednesday, Wednesday. 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 I could be wrong. Okay, Wednesday it is. Wednesday the 14th, 7 o'clock. Please. Warning. LTA, will LTA be there? Will LTA be able to attend Wednesday at 7 o'clock? <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Excellent. Thank you very much. And with that, I move we adjourn to closed session. And I'll second. First and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 We are now in closed session.